What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters Live. I'm David Wilson, and we're back with another Friday stream where we get together as a community and talk about whatever topic I've come up with a week, and this week is no exception. Uh, this is quite a uh, big deal of a stream, at least for me, because we're going to be talking about a very cool project, and we have some special guests on to discuss it with us. So uh, we'll introduce them in a moment, but for now, uh, we will say hello to the folks who have joined so far and then get into the updates. So hello to uh, Christine, Craig, uh, Parnika Pore, sorry. Uh, let's see, who else is here? Judy is here, uh, Menacing Mecca, Ashraz, uh, Peter, Jeff. All right. Uh, Ashraz says, systemcrapers.net seems misconfigured. Yes, Codeberg is having trouble at the moment. Sorry for that. I don't know what's happening. Like, I actually tried to push the show notes like two hours ago, and the CI still has not kicked off so it can rebuild the site. So, uh, you know, that's static website uh, CI issues for you. Christine says, I blame global warming. Probably. I don't know. I think that Codeberg just has some general cruftiness that uh, needs, needs to be resolved. I like Codeberg a lot, but I've been having like, some trouble here and there. Hello to uh, John, Akites, Mjolnir, Eric. Uh, Bart, Christopher, uh, three times zero. Thank you all for joining. Appreciate you being here today. Hello to Robson. All right, let's get into the updates. So um, first thing is also some big news this week is I'll be speaking at Libre Planet 2024. This is a yearly conference that's put on by the Free Software Foundation. And this year, the theme is uh, cultivating community. And for some reason, they decided that I am qualified to give a keynote on this topic. So uh, I will be giving a keynote on cultivating community. Uh, you can go check out, whoops, sorry, people. I'm exposing your faces. Uh, uh, there's a press release on the Free Software Foundation website you can check out uh, with more information about that. Um, and you can also check out, check out the Libra Planet 2024 website uh, to learn more about the conference. As I've been mentioning the previous few weeks, um, they have a call for sessions out right now in case you want to give a talk at Libre Planet if you want to be there too. Um, so definitely give that a look in case you are interested in submitting a talk. Um, so uh, whenever all the announcements about this came out this week, uh, one of our community members, Shom, uh, said that it would probably be a good idea to have a meetup uh, while the conference is going on. So uh, I think I'll probably try to set one up. So if you're in the Boston area or you can easily get to the Boston area next March, uh, whether or not you're at the conference, uh, I'll try to set up something so we can kind of uh, meet up and have a little get together and talk about our uh, 15th iteration of our Emacs configuration or how many times we've broken our Geeks config, that kind of thing, you know, just general small talk conversation. So um, really excited to be given a keynote there, uh, a little bit intimidated, honestly, imposter syndrome to the max, but that's cool. It's, it's a learning experience. Uh, another thing to mention is that uh, another well-known member of the Emacs community, uh, Philip or PCAL, has created a new uh, Elpa and Emacs zine, or kind of like a newsletter of sorts. Um, this is a pretty cool resource that will give you updates on the actual development of Emacs. So any new things that are happening in Emacs Devel mailing list that week, uh, things that you might need to know about. Uh, also for new packages that are being released on Elpa and well, both the GNU Elpa and non-GNU Elpa. Uh, and also just general you know, status reports that people want to give about the status of whatever they're doing related to uh, Emacs development. Um, and if you look down at the bottom here, there's a section about uh, contributing and uh, uh, PCAL puts his motivations here that uh, one is that he wants to involve more people in core Emacs development by giving information about what's happening in Emacs development, which I think is a great idea because you can go follow uh, Satya Chua's uh, weekly Emacs news, which is an excellent resource for keep keeping up to date about what's going on. But you know that's more of like an aggregation of links that sends you to some of the interesting discussions on Emacs Devel, but you kind of have to go through and read all that yourself. So I think what's happening here is that uh, this zine will compile a lot of the information in a more digestible form in case you want to uh, stay up to date on what's happening with Emacs development. Uh, but also, uh, PCAL is looking for contributors who is, are also willing to help uh, gather some of this information or uh, write re reviews of packages, <clears throat> excuse me, or, you know, uh, pretty much anything else that's listed here. So if you're interested in possibly contributing to this zine, uh, give... Uh, PCAL an email, I think, oh, there's a there's a mailing list. So you can join the mailing list and uh, discuss it there. Uh, definitely a cool new resource, so I recommend checking it out. I think there's also an Atom feed. So if you want to put that in your L feed reader or whatever you use for uh, RSS, 
then uh, you can follow it there. What else? So I think there's also, hmm, let's see, David Thompson uh, Siegel. Okay, Google. I've had enough. Where is it? I know it will show up somewhere here. Uh, Guile Hoot. Where is it? Anyway, there, there's a Siegel talk by uh, David Thompson and, and uh, uh, Robin Templeton coming up, I think November 3rd and 4th. So it's like maybe two or three weeks from now. I think this is a, like a live streamed presentation. They'll, they'll be able to tell us more about that in a moment, but I wanted to put this in the show notes. Uh, Hoot. I just saw for a second there that uh, Andrew Tropin's given a presentation too. Programming an OS distribution. That's cool. All right. Nice to see that. So anyway, I'll put this in the show notes in case anybody is interested in watching that talk to learn more about Guile Hoot, more than maybe what you'll hear today. Cool, cool, cool. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting over a cold, so I think that we're going to end up having some uh, voice issues today, but we'll try to get through it. So, uh, this week, the Sprightly Institute, uh, more on that in a moment, uh, published an article describing the latest developments in Guile Hoot, which is a new tool chain for building web app, uh, WebAssembly applications, particularly with Scheme. Now, um, if you've been around in the Scheme community for a while, there's been many, many implementations of Scheme. Uh, some compile to C, some compile natively, some compile to custom bytecode interpreters, etc. <clears throat> we haven't really had a high quality uh, scheme to WebAssembly compiler yet, but now we will have one and we have one that's currently, you know, pretty far along, uh, at least in terms of what I've seen, uh, which makes it possible to potentially write applications for the web and maybe even for other platforms uh, using Guile Scheme compiled to WebAssembly. So it's kind of huge news from that perspective, but there's other aspects of this that are also really important. So uh, this news came out this week, I believe, and I wanted to give some more exposure to it because I think it's really important. And I'm really excited about it because it might help me achieve some of my own goals or things I want to do with Scheme that I've been trying to work on for a while, but I think this may actually be a better path. So uh, I, this is a project that I'll probably be contributing to uh, in the very near future. So. Um, not only are we going to be talking about this today, we actually have uh, three of the four members of the development team of Guile Hoot today uh, on the call with us, who I would like to introduce right now. Let me just. So uh, I was starting to introduce uh, Christine Limmer Weber, uh, who is in the center of the screen now, which uh, she was on the other side of the screen before. Um, Christine has been a longtime uh, free software hacker. Um, uh, working on a lot of the GNU projects, plus uh, the creating Media Goblin, which is a project that I don't hear too many people talking about, uh, but it's a super interesting, uh, like media server plus website, you know, streaming type app. Uh, I can't say I know a whole lot about it, but I have seen it being used in a lot of places. Uh, also, Christine uh, co-authored and did a lot of work to advance the ActivityPub specification. So if you are a user of uh, Mastodon or any of the other Fediverse ActivityPub uh, implementations, Christine is uh, highly uh, was highly involved in the development of that. Uh, and also is now doing the um, work on the uh, Object Capability Network standard, which is what Sprightly Goblins is based on. Uh, so there's another big standardization effort happening underway with that. And uh, that's sort of the, the whole purpose of, I think, the Sprightly Institute, which we'll get into in a, in a bit. Um, so uh, definitely happy to have uh, Christine here. I actually had been intending to interview Christine uh, around uh, ActivityPub at some point in the past, but I'm, I'm terrible at setting up these interviews. Things happen better for me when it's like last minute and it's all broken. So anyway, uh, also we have uh, uh, David Thompson here today, uh, who probably if you have been in... Uh, around in the Guile community or Geeks community for a while, you've seen some of the things that he's made, uh, like Haunt, the uh, static website generator, uh, or even the Chickadee uh, game programming library for Guile Scheme. Uh, a lot of other uh, contributions to the uh, Geeks ecosystem in general. So we're really happy to have uh, Dave on to, to discuss uh, uh, his work on, uh, on Hoot. Also, we have uh, Robin Templeton, who is a compiler hacker who worked on uh, JavaScript engines at uh, Egalia, I, I think more recently, before coming to uh, Sprightly. Um, 
And if you have also been in the Emacs sphere for a while, you might also have heard of Robin from their work on uh, Guile Emacs, which is something that people keep asking me about every now and then. Like, when are we going to have you know a, an Emacs that is using Guile? And uh, I, I wonder the same thing, but I know it's not so easy to make that happen. So maybe one day we can have something like that. I, I see that Christine wants to say something. Well, I don't know. Can I can I say something? And is it audible? Does it work? Yeah, it's, it sounds low to me. Can anybody hear what Christine is saying? Is, is it super low or is it OK? I'll try talking, too. Hello, everybody. Yeah, to me, it sounds low, but it may just be me. And the stream chat is a little bit slow here. It is a bit low. OK, it's let me see low. if I can. Well, I can turn it up in public control. Is it just me or is it everything I know it's, it's, it's everything. Um, I think something's wrong with how I have it set up. Let's see if I can just tweak some settings here for a moment. I apologize for that. Settings, audio device, audio output default. That, did that work? I can I can up my uh, I can up my recording level as well on my microphone. So that would help. This would make it a little bit louder. Is that work okay? Yeah, I think the problem is that um, something about the Jitsi call is it sounds like I'm on telephone audio and not real, like full audio. Mm -hmm. Once again, let me turn the. Uh, you, somebody said it was much better. Let oh, me actually are, bump that back. It's, people are saying it's better now. So that's, that's good news. All right, let's go with that. So, I'm just going to jack that volume way, way up. All right. Also, I'll turn right. the... Uh, Crank the gain and blow everyone's speakers out. Hey, maybe that's what's happening that's right, right now. I, I can see it redlining. <laughs> okay, let me turn the music <laughs> off. Up the gain, pump it up, right? Um, yeah, so hi. It's exciting to be here on the show. Um, it's thrilling to have a show like System Crafters that, like, actually... Um, it, I mean, so... I. I think everybody at the Sprite Institute's a fan, actually, because we're uh, because like the all all your stuff is like all the stuff that like we internally use and advocate. It's like for a while there, it was just like you know like oh it's like little weirdos on the internet who like are like <laughs> oh yeah Guile and like geeks and Emacs and stuff like that. And so it's really cool to see like this community growing around all this type of stuff. Um, so yes, I'm the CTO of the Sprightly Institute. Um, I also am kind of the technical founder of like the first set of technology that came into it um uh you know i'm i'm not the only person in leadership at the Spratly institute we also have um we also have uh, randy farmer as the executive director who built like literally the first social networks ever on the internet uh you should check out lucasfilm's habitat if you never did it's wild to find out that that stuff existed um and uh, and we we also uh, um, uh, another one of the hoot hackers is not here for this particular call. That's Andy Wingo, who's the lead developer here. Um, I will admit, I'm actually not a developer on Hoot. I am the person who kind of, um, from the technical perspective, uh, kind of like helped lay out the plan um, and everything, and kind of did some pre research. Um, to be able to be like, okay, I think this is a good direction and stuff like that. But it's really Andy and Robin and Dave um, who have done this work. Um, a lot of other Sprightly's tech, uh, I have been more directly involved in. Goblins uh, did start as my design um, and, um, you know, based on other research. Um, and uh, we have um, another excellent engineer who's also not on this call, Jessica Talon, who does work on that. Um, but we're... we're this is a hoot centric call so really i'm here almost more as like the technical mascot of the spraley institute rather than like i mean well you know we've got other monstery characters like the actual goblin who's the technical mascot but um but i'm i'm here to i'm here to you know as the hype lady of the spraley institute uh really so well that's that's a very important role i, I think uh, i would call you the motivating force of uh, everything that's going on there so that, that's uh, probably the most important role because otherwise, I mean, there would be no Sprightly Institute, right? So, so yes, uh, it's unfortunate that Andy couldn't be here today as well, but uh, it's like nighttime for Andy right now, I think, on Friday, which it is here for me too. So. And, and additionally, Andy just presented about Guile Hoot 
to the WebAssembly um, like standards group uh, yesterday, and so like has been traveling and etc. So, so that's why Andy's not able to join us on this. Call. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I actually saw the uh, the slides that he posted today from that. It was super interesting stuff. So uh, if anybody is interested in more like the the low level technical details of what they've been doing with Hoot, uh, check out the the slides of Andy's talk. If you're on um, Mastodon or Vetiverse, you can go find him on well. Just search for Andy Wingo, you'll find him because, you know, pretty unique name. But uh, you'll be able to find that post that he posted today, which uh, uh, pretty cool stuff. So let's see. Do, right. do you mind me interjecting one second? Because we, since we do have two other guests and I feel like I got the proper introduction, I feel like as my job as a CTO, I need to make sure the other two people here also get good introductions. Um, and so I'm taking over your stream for a second, David, no like problem. the jerk that I am, no problem. Uh, and saying, so let's introduce both Robin and Dave. Robin was on the top project before Dave was, so let's start go with Robin first. Um, so Robin, uh, um, would you like to introduce what you've been doing within the, the Hoot ecosystem? Like what parts of the project you've been doing? Uh, sure. I started off uh, working on fairly low-level parts of the system, uh, working on the assembler and making it useful for writing manually written WebAssembly programs. Um, and lately, I've been working more on the uh, standard library and the higher-level features uh, to uh, make it usable for real-world scheme programs. Uh, Including the numeric it's... tower. Including the um, tower, and uh, yeah, so and that's so that's a continuing effort as uh, we keep adding new features. Mm -hmm. Getting pretty close on it. And Dave, um, Dave was um, doing our people may have seen our distributed debugger, uh, the amazing distributed debugger blog post that Dave did that shows off our our incredibly cool a system that's able to kind of describe um, and let you travel backwards and forwards in time and and like figure out what's happening inside of a distributed goblin system. But we transferred Dave off the project, not permanently, but um, but for to, to be able to, for Dave to be able to do something on the Hoot project, which was a not in our original grant for this, but then we decided we needed it. So Dave, would you like to explain what you're doing? And then I will let this be David uh, Wilson's uh, show again after that's that. That's okay. I, I'm I'm totally fine. <laughs> Sure. So yeah, I, I came on to the Hoot project over the summer, uh, and my task was to develop a, a WebAssembly interpreter uh, inside of Hoot, so implemented in Guile um, for the purposes of development so that we can run our test suite against it, we can debug small programs with it, and so that we can actually do kind of like the REPL-driven development that we want to be able to do with these things so we can be at the Guile REPL uh, write a write WebAssembly or write scheme code compiled to WebAssembly and then execute it directly in the REPL and get like kind of that immediate feedback. Um, so it's you know it's for development purposes. It's not a production system, so it's it's interpreted. It's not compiled, um, but it's a really uh, a really neat thing. And I've never done anything like that before. And it's been like uh, a hoot. Uh, to I can imagine. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of jealous actually. <laughs> Back to you, David. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, th there's some some bits and pieces of the interesting stuff that I wanted to talk about uh, in what they just told you. Uh, you know, assembler, interpreter, etc. Let me see if I can get my uh, show notes pulled up because everything just you know dis disintegrated recently. Okay, here we go. Org present. So. Um, if I get back into the site, I'll have to pull the screen off the site a little bit here. Uh, I want to show the the blog post that was uh, published this week. Uh, the title of that blog post is Scheme in the Browser, A Hoot of a Tail. And uh, it basically describes the current work on the uh, Hoot tool chain. Um, uh, and it also gives a demonstration of this uh, really cool Wireworld uh, application that was written with the tool chain and you can actually run in your browser. Now, I should say up front that if you want to try out any of the uh, WebAssembly uh, modules or code that uh, is, are produced by this tool chain, you will need to have a very bleeding edge browser version. So like the Chrome uh, dev or uh, unstable version. Um, and, or Firefox Nightly, I believe, like up-to-date up versions of either of those browsers because there are some features in WebAssembly like 
uh, garbage collection and uh, tail call support that is needed for this. So you will need to have a newer version, uh, unreleased version of those, those browsers to try this stuff out. Uh, I'm in Chrome Dev right now, and you can actually see down here that uh, the uh, application is, is working here. So this is the actual uh, uh, code that was compiled from Scheme to WebAssembly. We'll take a look at that uh, again in a little bit. But um, uh, the point being that, you know, we're at a, a state of the project, or they're at a state of the project where you can actually compile scheme code over to WebAssembly, load it in a browser and have it do interesting things. Um, so I wanted to sort of talk about what features have been implemented so far because uh, there's kind of a lot of foundational material here that would be useful, not just for anybody who wants to write a scheme application that we're in a web browser, but also for anyone who wants to write any tool that produces WebAssembly or even handles WebAssembly. So if you're a developer who maybe needs to do some um, management of WebAssembly, WebAssembly modu modules or analysis even, um, there is scheme code that you can use in a REPL or in a scheme file to analyze, uh, compile, disassemble, et cetera, uh, WebAssembly code, which I think is pretty amazing. So um, another really interesting aspect of this is there's no self-contained, sorry, there's a self-contained tool chain, which means there's no need for things like mscripten, binary in, uh, wapt, et cetera. So, uh, Probably it's a good opportunity for me to ask one of you uh, to give me uh, sort of your description of what WebAssembly is, because I'm saying WebAssembly a bunch of times, but maybe there's people here who haven't really heard much about it. Um, let, let me handle this one, because then Dave and Robin get to handle all the other technical things of how things work. Um, and uh, so what WebAssembly is, is um, it, you might remember like kind of the days when Java is like, we're the run everything virtual machine, right? You know, you can write once, run everywhere, right? Um, and in theory, there were all these other languages that can run on top of it. Closure famously runs on top of the JVM, and so it can run anywhere the JVM runs, right? Um, the In some ways, WebAssembly is kind of like that, but actually like kind of good and real, and like, you know, as the standard for the world. Um, but in another way, it's it's actually kind of a environment. It's a universal language runtime um, that is um, not only able. It makes it so that basically Java is not a JavaScript is not like the only participant on, on the web. It's kind of the big the big deal. Like you can bring your own language. Basically, is the deal is a big deal. And and I think people have known this like for a while. So in WebAssembly 1.0, there was basically, it was very low level in terms of like manual memory management, and it was very good for manually memory ma language, managed languages and stuff. Um, it was like kind of like a very low level kind of traditional computer, um, and um, like virtually. Uh, and um, one of the big things that's happened is that there's been this WebAssembly GC spec. Now, why would you want to use the garbage collector that came uh, with your host environment? Because you could compile in your own, um, and that's good for a few. Um, it's really exciting that we're able to have this for a few reasons. For one thing, by using WasmGC, the new extension, it's very performant. The browsers have extremely performant garbage collectors. Uh, it also means that um, you don't have cycle collection problems. If your garbage collector and the other garbage collector don't know how to cooperate, it's very challenging, right? So you're you're able to have what's you know the share to keep of the host language, which means that like everything's cooperating very nicely. It actually is an object capability security system, which many people don't realize, which you know we're big fans of in the Spratly Institute, and I won't go into here. Um, but it's um, the other big thing is, is that WebAssembly is really exciting because not only is this really exciting for the web, but increasingly we're starting to see WebAssembly being used as a deployment target um, even for kind of a general form to be able to distribute binaries and stuff like that. Um, and, um, you know, we have a WebAssembly interpreter. We've even been able to run programs that are not the scheme output of this to a certain degree. Um, I, I won't go into that further, but the, the general point is, if you're excited about the web not just being a platform for just JavaScript, WebAssembly opens that door for everyone. And... Basically, Guile, through our Hoot project, is now at the bleeding edge of that, um, as in terms of we're at the forefront and have actually kind of helped advance some of the um, some of the standard stuff by being advocates in that space, uh, by 
Um, and by Guile being able to have leadership here, this will also be a pattern so that everyone else can be first-class citizens on the web, Python, Lua, Ruby, whatever else you want. Could I add a quick bit of historical context? Of course. Um, so, I mean, you may have heard of languages that compile to JavaScript in the past. Um, you have things that are kind of more like a meta language, like a coffee script, or you have um, like closure script, which is closure compiled to JavaScript. And so using JavaScript as a, as a compilation target, because that's all you had uh, when you didn't want to write directly in JavaScript, that was the way to do it. And there are pros and cons to that. And there's a lot of compromises you have to make to make it happen. And over time, they, uh, this kind of awful hack was developed called ASM.js. And it was kind of this like low level form of JavaScript that was valid JavaScript, um, but it, ha it had a bunch of annotations in it that if the web browser understood them, could basically lower the JavaScript to some low level and, and, and run it and optimize it. And that was kind of the, the origin of WebAssembly was this is terrible. Let's actually make a proper bytecode and make a decent compilation target for the web. So that's like, that's the big idea, a, a, a reasonable compilation target for the web so that you can run things that are not JavaScript. And I will share one last bit, just to back up, Dave. I was at a WebAssembly standards meeting uh, kind of early on and met uh, some people who said that it, that exact process with ASM.js, by everybody hating it, because it could you could run the slow version, it forced all browsers to adopt it, because otherwise else these 3D games would work in other browsers, and nobody wanted it, but, but it would look like they were just slow versions of JavaScript. So everybody had to adopt it, but everyone agreed it was bad, like it was not good. And so um, that was the trick that led everybody to be like, okay, let's get really good, really good like programming language designers to come together and say, how do we do this right? So WebAssembly is kind of the how do we do this right version. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm really impressed that they, uh, you know, added things like, you know, tail calls, because that's not a common feature in programming languages. But for Scheme, it's critical because you have to have tail calls. Recursion is like the most common uh, iteration construct. I mean, it is the iteration construct. So, um, you know, anything that would compile to JavaScript would always have to use like a trampoline or something of that nature uh, in the past. So it sort of emulates yep. tail calls, but it doesn't really work very well with the system. So uh, now having that, you know, host managed GC plus uh, actual tail call support, it just means that Scheme can be a literal first class citizen and not just some hacked in uh, language into the platform. So for, for anyone who is, uh, you know, a big fan of Scheme, uh, we're at a point now where you can legitimately write Scheme applications in the browser. Now, I will say that you know, obviously, the Hoot project still has you know some work to do. To you know, they'll talk about that a little bit as well about what you know where they want to head with the project and how much they want to flesh things out. But um, just rest assured, by sometime next year, you're going to have a fully fledged you know Scheme implementation that runs in WebAssembly, and also uh, for any. Uh, WebAssembly runtime that runs on desktop or server, et cetera, mobile, if that exists, I don't know if it exists currently, um, you would be able to write a, a scheme application that targets multiple platforms. So you don't have to, to depend on the Guile VM anymore. You can depend on WebAssembly, which is going to be heavily supported by many people because of the, you know, the, the, the benefits it gives you. So whenever I have a uh, inflammatory stream title, like this is the future of scheme hacking. That's sort of what I mean is now you have the ability to, you know, go really far with scheme rather than just have to be in the sandbox of your particular scheme implementation, this being Guile. Um, yes, thank you so much for the, the background on WebAssembly um, because I'm not an expert in WebAssembly. So it'd be, it's nice to have people who know what's, what's happening with that to explain it. Uh, let me get back to the blog post here. Sorry, I have to keep dragging your faces off the screen. Um, so, uh, they also mentioned, uh, GC reference type usage. So that's something that's being provided by the WebAssembly runtime now in the newest versions of browsers. Uh, so, uh, as Christine mentioned, that ability to, uh, have objects in your scheme code in WebAssembly that also are garbage collected in the same way as the JavaScript objects, uh, in the system means that 
you can have this interrelation between your JavaScript and scheme code that can be garbage collected correctly. So it you kind of avoids a certain class of problems that uh, may have had may have been there before. Uh, small programs produce small binaries, which is kind of a cool thing. Like that's something I've always wanted from a scheme implementation is to be able to just you know compile the the minimal amount of uh, binary output necessary to execute something. And I believe that there's a lot of work in Hoot that uh, kind of pairs down uh, everything that's included with the binary such that only what you use gets included there. I think they call that uh, whole program optimization or something uh, like that. Uh, so that's another kind of cool thing that, that is interesting about this project. Uh, full development environment, compile and run WASM binaries without leaving Guile. So having a, a, a uh, WASM interpreter inside of Guile for the purposes of development means that you don't have to go fire up you know, Chrome to test out your program. Uh, you can just test out the logic in the REPL as you're developing it just straight inside of Guile, which I think is uh, another really interesting feature of this whole tool chain. Um, so self-contained self tool chain, basically all the parts that you need to... Um, interpret, uh, assemble, link, uh, produce binary output files, et cetera, uh, is, is provided by Hoot. So this is like a whole tools chain. So it's not just for Scheme, it's for anything. Uh, if you want to write a compiler for a custom language that you're coming up with, or maybe a, a WebAssembly compiler for some other existing language, you could do that with Guile Scheme using the Hoot libraries and then produce the WebAssembly yourself, assemble it and do everything you need to do because this is a full tool chain for uh, interacting with WebAssembly. And uh, I don't think that really exists currently. There's no like programmable tool chain for WebAssembly. There's there's programs that you can use, like a it's almost like the like a GCC for WebAssembly, uh, like these other things, binary in and et, et cetera. Um, now you have something that's fully scriptable. So it gives you a lot more power in how you're able to apply WebAssembly for whatever problem that you're trying to solve. So you can make really, really small, simple programs that don't need a whole bunch of extra library stuff involved. If you know how you want to construct a WebAssembly to produce a program, uh, you can uh, do that very easily with these libraries. Uh, there's also another blog post uh, that came before this one, which shows the low level um, libraries at work, which I think was really interesting because it shows you how you have like a higher level API that can enable you to generate your program code. You're not compiling Scheme to WebAssembly. You're using Scheme to template uh, WebAssembly, actual WebAssembly code. So if you were to scroll down in this blog post, there's an example around here. They, so they go through a, a process of taking this kind of hard-coded WebAssembly, which if you look at some of the stuff, which looks like S expressions, but it's kind of funky, i32.const, et cetera, uh, that's actually WebAssembly code. Um, and then eventually they start templatizing this with just typical scheme features like back quoting and uh, splicing. So you can templatize WebAssembly code and then run it through the compilation routines of, of Hoot to produce the output. Um, and then run it with a standard WebAssembly uh, interpreter. In this case, the WASM for like Fantasy Console, which is a pretty cool little project. Excuse me. <coughs> so. There's multiple levels to this, and that's why I kind of wanted to talk about it. I think that people need to understand the value of this outside of it just being a scheme to WebAssembly compiler, which is by itself amazing. But if you have all this extra functionality available, then the more intrepid uh, hacker could potentially use this to do some really interesting things, um, including building their own platforms on WebAssembly effectively uh, and, and doing some really low-level coding that could be a lot more uh, efficient than having Scheme to WebAssembly uh, compiled code. So um, anything that you all want to add to that? I know I just rambled a lot about what I think is the benefits, but uh, please feel free to fill in the gaps there. I think you hit the nail on the head, David. I think that covers it uh, really, really well. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better. So let me see. I would like to ask some more questions related to all this stuff. Um, I mean, I, I alluded before to the possibility of there being like WebAssembly runtimes on mobile. Obviously, web browsers on mobile will have WebAssembly runtime. But do you know if there's like a, an application platform for WebAssembly on mobile where someone could like load a WebAssembly module in and then talk to like a API to make a, like a full app? 
I don't know of anything like that right now. Um, I know that like IoT people are involved in the WebAssembly community group. So they have like, there are these like embedded device um, things. So like mobile devices or otherwise. Um, and I know there's, I've seen other, um, I've seen a startup um, that has a platform that's trying to kind of abstract away a lot of this WebAssembly stuff, but I don't know if it does what you're, what you're looking for. So yeah, I don't know of anything. Uh, let, let me jump in. Uh, so f for example, you could actually say this, we already do have one, right? And that's actually the, the web browser, right? So like the part, part of what's the most popular way that people end up writing web applications today, right? It's like a, electron apps, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, so um, what, one of the things I think has been a little bit like not to my satisfaction in the Guile world has been like like application building as in like terms of interfaces and stuff like that, you know? Um, and, um, you know, we, one of the reasons that we decided to go with the Hoot project was because, um, you know, we knew we had to do, we wanted to do um, native applications. And it may be that we actually use a different environment for native applications than we end up using for the web. But I suspect for mobile applications, at least, um, we will probably actually do something akin to what people do with like Electron apps, right? Because um, we could, and it doesn't have to be, so, you know, right now, Electron means buying into the whole ecosystem of like NPM and Node and all that type of stuff, right? But what if you didn't have to do that, right? What if we just had a very thin browser-like thing that launches um, and then it launches what was actually a Guile application. What if instead of the horrors of the world of NPM where like you get all these like one billion tiny dependencies that you can't make sense of, if you've ever tried to package an NPM app, like one of the most popular blog posts I ever wrote was like, you know, like let's package jQuery, a, a JavaScript dystopia novella, right? Um, like, but we have geeks, right? We have reproducibility. What if we actually could actually build reproducible things that were kind of like Electron and that were lightweight and running WebAssembly things, and then just actually lift and use the whole um, system that we have in the browser. People are already doing that today for mobile applications, but now that becomes open to us too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and things even like a React Native, which I think React Native is using a web browser with like, like a bridge to native UI controls. So you could imagine yeah. something like that possibly working on mobile uh, as another option. So um, I, that's what another thing that really excites me because for me, I love writing scheme code and I want to write an app for myself that like, let's say note taking or to do lists or whatever. I want something that works both on the desktop and also on mobile and, you know, it gives me the, the full capabilities of a scheme to do interactive development and also, you know, really easy updating the code on the device, et cetera. And I feel like this is the first time we might actually be able to get something like that that doesn't require like a compile to C thing like Gambit scheme or anything else like that, which is a lot more heavyweight. So um, at me as like sort of a, a scheme developer, I see a lot of potential in app development for sure. Um, but also I think, you know, just general cross-platform applications. I mean, I know that Guile, you know, has had traditionally some issues on Windows. I feel like if we have a good sort of uh, yeah. WebAssembly runtime that is cross-platform, that you know, just prov provides the normal system calls you would need for you know, file IO, et cetera, um, that, that could also make it easy to de easier to deploy Guile applications, even just server-side applications across, on cross-platform. That, that is an interesting point. And uh, based on some uh, the conversation I'm seeing in the chat, I think it's probably a good time to clarify this, is that like Hoot is not just about compiling scheme for the web of course like with sprightly's goals yes ultimately the motivating reason is to run uh, goblins applications in the web browser that's the main thing however hoot is not directly tied to the web platform it's not directly tied to javascript and one of the interesting things about like system interfaces like you were talking about like doing file io and stuff um there's a, a thing called wasi which is the web assembly system interface right now WASI is very much tied to kind of the linear memory world mm. of, you know, the, the, the folks that are compiling like C and Rust, those kinds of languages to WebAssembly. It's not exactly open to us at the moment, um, but you're right. Like if, if that evolves to be more welcoming to, to WASM GC, um, then you could do the same thing. You could write, you know, use Hoot, compile a scheme program that's actually running natively. 
uh, you know, well, I guess air quotes natively, yeah, yeah. Um, but not within a web browser in a, in a different runtime entirely. So um, that's also a, a design, like a, a big design uh, uh, goal for us, not, not to be tied to JavaScript. Yeah, I, I guess the complexity there uh, is that if you have libraries that are written for code compiled with Hoot, they have to be a little bit more aware of the deployment environment, whether it's the web or, you know, like a WASI interface. Because if, let's say you want to write an OpenGL binding, it needs to do WebGL on the browser, it needs to do OpenGL on, on desktop. That could be complicated. But, but I imagine that's one of the things that will get shaken out over time. Dave, can you talk about Condexpand and how this could apply to, somebody was asking about Chickadee earlier. Yeah, okay, so for, for those that don't know, I do dabble in game development as a hobby. It's not a profession by any means. Um, so I know a little bit uh, about uh, graphics programming and things like that. And, and what Christine said about Condexpand is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a syntax that in, in Scheme you use to match on available features at compile time. So for example, you know, we're used to calling C libraries through a foreign function interface. And so, you know, if you want to call an OpenGL function to do graphics, right, you have to uh, bind to libgl and, and fetch the, the functions out of there and call them. That's, again, that's a native, that's when you're on the native platform. Um, but through the, the condexpand syntax, you could do a conditional check. Am I on native? Okay, then I'm going to, I'm going to wrap a C function. Am I in Hoot? Am I compiling for the web? Well, then in that case, I'm going to import a host function that provides um, that binding for me. Um, so uh, there's a, for example, there's a Guile OpenGL library right now, of course, because Guile is only a native thing. It just, it's all about the CFFI. Well, that could be abstracted to, depending on the target you're compiling for, either do CFFI or, or uh, WASM uh, host imports. Yep. Yeah. Sweet. And I'm yeah. looking forward to the day we can do graphics uh, yes. with it. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask you because, like, you know, next month is the uh, GitHub game off, and I'm thinking about using Hoot for doing an entry there. Obviously, graphics may not be as, so easy. I guess you, the way that you did Wireworld is you sort of have the JavaScript code calling into the, the, the kernel of the scheme code, so you could do it that way. But Yeah, that's exactly right. So, yeah, good observation. Uh, you're, you're really paying attention here. Um, I, I did a lot of research. That, that's, yeah, so that that is kind of the limitation right now is that, we don't have a foreign function interface for host functions right now, say calling JavaScript from scheme. So right now you call, you call uh, scheme from JavaScript. Um, so if your um, needs are, are reasonable, you don't need to shuffle a lot of data across that boundary, the, the, the scheme JavaScript boundary, uh, and you're okay with say rendering to a canvas or, or whatever, uh, you could do it. Um, I just don't, you're not gonna be doing like a, a, a crazy bullet heck game where you're dealing with like thousands of particles and simulating them uh, and getting them across that boundary quickly enough to render at 60 frames per second. That, that won't happen yet. But uh, <laughs> for small things, I think you could totally do it. Yeah. Well, I, whenever the like OpenGL support comes along and you can do things like create, you know, uh, uh, buffers, vertex buffers, et cetera, that, yep. that kind of stuff where it's all stored in the GPU, then I think that's going to be way easier. There are emerging WebAssembly proposals around making it easier to access, um, say, JavaScript's typed buffers or shared array buffers. Uh, when that comes along, that'll really open the doors um, for doing uh, hardware accelerated rendering uh, from WebAssembly, which does involve just shuffling data through buffers, like yep. a lot of that. Yep, yep. Um, so I, I have my eye on WebGPU personally, and I'm working slowly on my free time on a scheme interface for that, so that Sweet. when Hoot is ready for it and WebAssembly in general is ready for it, we can do WebGPU stuff using you know all the modern graphics APIs um, from Scheme. So I don't know. One day. Super exciting, though. I mean, I feel like uh, you will see a lot more Scheme getting used in game jams and just general game development projects for that, which uh... I hope so. And when we enter in game jams, it'll just mean more people can play them if they're yep. uh, it's embedded like as a, you know, right in the browser, that yep. would be excellent. Yep. And, of course, and of course, that's what we want to do with goblins, right? You want to be able to try goblins that way. Just like, you know, we, we talk about goblins and it's really neat. And how, we how great would it be if you could just open a link and, and play with it? You know, that's, that's what we want. Maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about goblins and how it, it fits into the picture of uh, what uh, Hoot is meant for. 
Christine? Uh, um, I'll, I'll take over that one because uh, um, uh, I guess you could say I'm chief goblin uh, in terms of uh, I'm not the chief chief I'm not the executive director but I'm I'm the chief goblin maybe uh, the uh, uh, the so goblins goblins is a distributed programming environment basically is a short way of describing it it what what happens in goblins and and David actually has a wonderful blog post that um, I'm gonna link that um, maybe kind of is like the easiest way to kind of understand what's uh, why this is exciting for somebody who's never seen this before. Let me see, I'm trying to find it. Um, it's the Growing a Network Garden, this one. Um, so this, this blog post is really nice because it shows Dave, like this was like first week on the job. Dave had never used Goblins before. And Goblins, I said it's a distributed programming environment, right? Now, it, it has some nice features. It has, you know, like, it has a, um, like, kind of this thing we shorthand to calling time travel, but it's really transactionality, um, so that, like, an error happens, it can automatically roll back. Um, we are working on automatic persistence so that you can save to, you know, you can have, like, a, you can imagine a big, multi massively multiplayer game, and then, like, it out the whole state of the thing, you know, saves to disk and you could just wake up everything back where it was and stuff like that. Um, we're, we're, um, that's, that's in progress. Um, it has, you know, distributed debugger and some other things, but that didn't exist yet because David just started. Um, so David never used it before. And one of the things that I really like about this blog post, um, is that, um, I think it was on like maybe day three of Dave working here. Dave had read an article I had written about the goblins, but had never used it before. Um, I'm like, okay, you know enough. Write an example application. Make me a community garden, right? You know, like, uh, and and that was after some conversation because Dave likes to garden. Um, the uh, um, but you know, and and so Dave makes this little community garden application. And what? Ha how much work did you have to do, Dave, to make it a network available to be a peer-to-peer -peer community garden application? Oh yeah, very very little work. I had to do a few lines to hook it up to OCAP, and, and then things things worked. I developed the whole thing without network first. Got the, you know, all the objects in my world interacting, and then pushed some of them to a different machine. It was pretty neat. So so goblins is really it's a distributed. It's kind of an actor model type thing you might say, um, but it's actually more accurately the that model of computation, but that's not really important here. Um, but what it is, is it's a distributed secure programming environment to enable a distributed encrypted peer-to-peer -peer, um, programming environment where um, it, you can collaborate securely with um, other entities on the network with a very intentional, conse intentionally consensual uh, way of sharing things, which is called object capability security. If you really, if this sounds really exciting to you, we have a whole paper, um, and it uses an alternate representation of scheme to not, uh, uh, of Lisp to not scare people off called WISP, though these are all actually programs that run in there, um, that, um, so the, uh, it uses white space, but it's still actually Lisp programs. Um, but Quite it nice. is, uh, this whole paper walks you through what Goblins is and how it works and everything like that. Um, it's worth noting that the other engineer, Jessica Tallon, um, her main work since then has been on OCAPN, which is the Object Capability Network, which is our network protocol, which allows for distributed programming. In a way, what you can think of here is that, um, you know, ActivityPub, it was really good for, it, it was actually more general than what people realize, but people realize it's good for social networking, right? Um, and there was kind of this vision as in terms of like how I thought that, you know, this stuff could be used as in terms of um, the actor model and the kind of security and safety and community properties we could have if we did that type of thing. It was really hard to get people to understand how to build that type of stuff when what people are really used to are stuff like, um, you know, Rails and, you know, Django and things like that, which have this very client server type architecture, right? Um, what's exciting about Goblins is that you get the security properties, you get all these types of things with just ordinary programming patterns. And so um, so th that's what Goblins is, basically. Um, sorry, that was a lot of ramble. I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back. So um, in the context of, of Hoot, basically what you would be able to do is write a scheme application that can make use of this networked programming system 
uh, sim simpler API, you don't really have to think about you know TCP sockets or web sockets or anything of that nature. You're just thinking in terms of there's there's someone, well there there is an agent or an actor who is either in the same code or somewhere else. It doesn't really matter where they are, and uh, I can call things on them or send them messages effectively to to make things happen. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, do you think so? What what I saw from reading the uh, the documentation about goblins is that currently the the Tor uh, net layer is the only one. Do you think you'll end up having one that works in the browser? <laughs> it's not Timely the only question. one. It's not Timely the question. <laughs> it's not the only one right now. We also have just a, a plain old uh, TCP TLS net layer, of course, on the web. Uh, I, I would imagine we need a WebSockets layer that's not developed, but um, Christine can probably say what we've built on top of TCP TLS. So that's the TCP TLS one has not been released yet. That was what David was doing right before getting transitioned oh. up onto the the Hoot stuff. That's right. Um, and and we're we're about to have a new Goblins release out soon. That's going to have that in there, but we're not actually encouraging people to use the TCP TLS layer directly. We have a net, a net layer that's called the relay net layer, which is actually the TCP TLS just allows you to connect to some sort of, you know, like server. It, this is for when you want a fast way of connecting to peers, but you don't want to use Tor, which is not fast, um, but you want it to be secure where the server can't screw with your stuff. Right. Um, but you, um, but you, you're, you're living in the world that we currently live in, which is client server, right? So what you do is you basically pick some sort of node, which is your hub, you know, kind of like picking a Fediverse instance or something like that, right? Um, and, um, but you have this client here that is your thing just acts like it's speaking to everything else. And what happens is it's actually a net layer on top of a net layer. It's an abstracted relay net layer that uses the TCP TLS net layer underneath it. Um, there's an incredibly wild GIF that I have somewhere um, that, that shows off the mechanics of this when we were figuring it out. I can see if I can find it. Um, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it's fun stuff. Um, so yeah, the people will not be required to use the Tor one very soon. Um, so I, I assume yeah. that uh, the same thing would apply if you had a way to connect via WebSockets to such a relay, uh, you'd be able to, uh, I guess, rendezvous with other Client. Like, like if you had a multiplayer game in the browser, you would be Correct. able to connect through the relay to other players and send game data back and forth uh, between the, the different clients. That's right. Cool. Yeah. That, that was the one thing I was wondering about because I, I am very interested in the possibility of writing something like a MUD or some other type of game using goblins in the browser. Yeah. Tor was just very easy to implement uh, initially. Um, it, it just It just had a lot of easy to use properties about it. But yeah, of course, we, this is more uh, performant things that we need to. Cool. All right. So that was a, a nice detour into goblins. Uh, so I guess uh, to, to, to reframe it back into the context, context of, of Hoot, the point of, of Sprightly getting involved in the development of Hoot, or one of the, one of the points, obviously just because this is an awesome thing to do, but uh, it's so that you can have these new style decentralized applications for the web. So you know, ActivityPub was sort of a step on the path to uh, OCAPN, where you know, ActivityPub is, is a, a decentralized protocol for activity information being sent between different servers. But now you have this, this new model, which almost enables a generalized decentralized protocol and not really like something that has to be specified exactly as activity pub has been specified. So you could be anything going through this, this thing. It's just like you have maybe even micro formats of, uh, uh actors the, that are on the, the network. The here, here's a way of thinking about it. When people talk about activity pub things, they make very, you know, I'm proud of the work on the activity pub, no doubt about it, but the particular contemporary, and, and we may actually provide an abstraction for activity pub, that works kind of like OCAPN so that you don't have to think about it as much, but that's in the future. Um, in, in Regardless um, whether or not that happens, um, we have a, the you can think of it this way. Um, Dave's community garden application, Dave didn't have to think about it being a particularly socially oriented type thing where it was being designed to be social. And yet it was able to be social, right? So what if instead of, 
us making very specific applications social? What if all applications could be social? But in the ways that you wanted to, in a way that's fit from a user freedom perspective, that respects users' autonomy and freedom and allows for consensual collaboration. Goblins reduces the barrier so that you can make distributed applications of anything that's important to you. Yeah, and I think that's, for, for this audience, I think there's actually something that maybe people haven't thought about. If you have the ability to easily write a decentralized application, you could imagine you as a system crafter could have your own tools that can communicate to each other through the internet in a very simple way and not have to worry about like low level TCP protocol stuff, et cetera. So I could imagine like having a server running on a really you know low powered VM that just sits and, w and waits for messages and it could orchestrate things in my workflow or in my environment or between my machines or things of that nature. And especially with a language like Guile, since you know if people are already using Guile for new geeks, then it stands to reason that you could very easily deploy a system that has a full system configuration and has just the little bits and pieces of the message handling or whatever baked into that. And you have like these really concise, you know, agents that get deployed anywhere in the world effectively. In fact, Ludovic Cortez has put some hints of this in that um, uh, I think we goblin pilled uh, Ludovic finally, uh, where uh, where if in some of the recent posts about you know Shepherd, which is Geeks's you know service managed in Daemon, uh, Ludovic's been saying, oh well, I've been ma working hard to make it more actor like, um, kind of closer in ideas to goblins, and maybe it will even use goblins, right? So imagine if Geeks's Daemon manager was using goblins. And imagine if Geeks' uh, um, even build system was using goblins, then you could hook, you could actually have Geeks services, you know, actually talking to each other using the same kind of a, um, secure network abstractions that we're using. And in fact, you would be able to remote administrate mm -hmm. machines and have them actually directly communicate over like these kinds of like custom microservices, but they really just resemble ordinary scheme code talking to each other. Um, and that just falls out of this type of system of using goblins, you know, but geeks, the goblins didn't exist when geeks was first initially being developed. So like this idea of like this, like goblins also being integrated into geeks and stuff like that. Part of the reason why we actually pivoted from racket to guile is like, we're like, if we move and start to be able to become, you know, cooperative with this community, like if we can get these worlds to touch each other, then like really exciting things could happen. Yeah, I, th I see there's there's a lot of, uh, it, I, I didn't really think about the, the possibility of hooking it into Shepard, but yeah, I can see how geeks could really leverage this significantly um, for a number of features. So, so, so basically it just sounds like, uh, all of this work is going to become super impactful in a relatively short time. I think that, you know, in the next year, we're going to see a lot of development, both in Goblins and in Hoot, uh, that will enable Goblins to be running in many places to so that anybody here could go use it and, and make really cool things with it that, you know, are personally useful or useful to, to everyone. Um, that's really exciting. Let me see if there's other questions that I had. We should eventually get to like showing off the, the tools. I also would like to hear from uh, Robin a bit. Um, so maybe when we get into some of the tool stuff, we can also talk to Robin about uh, some of the uh, similar dis the disassembler work. Uh, let's see. What else do I have here? Yeah, I think that we covered all the things. Okay, so. We, we we will show what is currently happening with the pre 0.1.0 release. Like the 0.1.0 will be out soon, right? Like within weeks, I assume, or next week. Next week, okay. I so, I am putting the finishing touches on that right now. Yeah, so I will be after the stream. Sweet. So what you see today is basically what you will see if you clone the repos and uh, set this up. Uh, is Guilehoot going to be included in the Geeks repositories, or is it still going to be its own like stuff, separate repo we, for now? Yeah, we we want to have it. Yeah, we want to submit a patch to to put Hoot there. Um, we're also thinking about setting up our own uh, Geeks channel as well, just for the really bleeding edge stuff. You know, that's not like officially released and like fit to put in Geeks. So we hope to have both options soon. Sweet. 
Cool. So, so basically, uh, a person who uses Geeks could potentially uh, try this stuff out next week by installing Guile Hoot or, I guess, Guile Hoot, right? Like, it was effectively yep. a library for Guile. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be Guile Dash Hoot. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, but until then, um, you could definitely clone the repository, which is on GitLab. Um, let me see if I can find the link to that here. Guile it, Hoot. You can use good old Geek Shell with that repository. Oh, so, yes. Uh, that that is the best way to do it. Uh, GitHub.com. Oh, GitLab. GitLab.com slash Sprightly, I think, slash uh, Guile yep. Hoot. So if you go to this repository right now, you can clone it. And if you have GNU Geeks installed, uh, there is a geeks.scm file that has everything you need to build it. Uh, I'm going to just drop into a, a V term here and roll over to the folder where I have this pulled down. Uh, projects code uh, Guile Hoot. In fact, well, let's just you know get it running and uh, then we can move on to the actual demo. So uh, geeks shell dash df the the readme says use just geek shell but uh if you if you do that you have to do this whole like echoing the thing to authorize directories i guess it's fine for people to do that but i usually just do geek shell dash capital df geeks to scm oh, sure. yeah and i've already installed everything so it just sort of loads up um we have guile in this environment whoops i wonder if i should do pure let me let me do that this may be a disaster, but whoops. Okay, Guile dash V. All right, so we've got the like pre-release version of Guile here. Uh, you can go into the Guile REPL and use uh, what is it? Uh, Hoot. Uh, oh yeah, you can't see my screen. I forgot. Hoot reflect. So ah. Probably there's an extra thing to do, a pre inst env. Anyway, if you've done any Geeks development, you've seen this pre inst env. So, uh, Guile. So, not super hard to get into it. Ah, uh, and tab completion is not working at the moment. Fine. Anyway, point being, um, very easy to get this set up if you have uh, Geeks installed already. You can just run the geeks.scm file to try out the Hoot toolchain itself. But what I really would like to do is uh, go into the uh, scheme-wireworld example, because it is a an, an example of compiling an application written with Scheme that uh, goes to WebAssembly and you can load it up in the browser. Uh, very similarly, you use Geek, uh, Geek Shell for this. So uh, let me drop down into that folder, actually. Uh, scheme, wireworld. Uh, and this is a manifest.scm file, so it's a little bit different. So geek shell uh, pure dash m manifest.scm. Uh, I'm still in the other geek shell. And I'm back in the other folder, too. OK, so now. Uh, there are two scripts in this folder. There is uh, wireworld.scm, which we'll take a look at. And I don't want buffer env to try to execute this manifest just yet. Not a whole lot of code here. This is sort of the core logic of the game. The interesting thing to, to, to note is that um, they're not using typical exports for the functions that are being provided by the WebAssembly module. Um, they sort of define a uh, quoted form, that is a let expression, that then returns values at the end. So I'm guessing this is sort of like the way that modules are currently being defined for now, WebAssembly modules. Um, but you see that there's actual scheme code here. And at the very end of the file, they say call with output file wireworld.wasm. Uh, that's a typical scheme code for uh, calling a function after loading a particular file for output. Uh, and then in the actual file here, they're, they're putting the byte vector, which is basically like, once you assemble the WASM, actually, let's go from the inside to the outside. Compile, compile wire world. They're compiling this whole form. So it's a quoted form. They're compiling that. So running it through the compiler, which produces sort of intermediate WASM output, I believe. And then assemble WASM takes that and turns it into binary code, effectively, a byte vector that can be written to a file and then loaded up by any WebAssembly environment like the browser. 
So effectively, you're just compiling that, that form, turning it into bytecode, and then writing it out to a file. So that file currently doesn't exist in this folder. Uh, you can see there's no wireworld.wasm, but we can go back into the shell and then run guile wireworld.scm. And it, the buffer m keeps popping up. But um, that, that was basically it. Nothing, no, nothing got written out as a problem. Uh, we see that there is a wireworld.wasm file here that's 89k, uh, which is not bad. I mean, it's, there's a little bit of code in that file, but you know, you have a lot of standard library stuff from Guile as well. And I think there's also uh, optimization flags you can use to make that even smaller, but at least for like the initial build, that's quite small. Um, now that we have that, there's also a script that you can run called Guile web server.scm. So if we run that, Guile web server.scm, and what that's gonna do is uh, stand up a local web server that's going to host this wireworld.wasm file plus an index.html file uh, so that you can load that up in uh, localhost. And then you can see that we actually have that application here. So uh, very simple process. And th there wasn't like a hoot compiler exe that you have to invoke to do this. You're actually using scheme code. Now, I imagine there are uh, command line programs that come with Hoot that will enable you to like run a compiler, et cetera. But uh, you don't necessarily need to do that. You can just have a scheme script that can do the compilation of your WebAssembly application. So you're using Guile scheme on the Guile VM to then invoke the compilation of scheme code that will be turned into WebAssembly and then load it up uh, or self-hosted effectively using Guile also. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I can sort of show this thing actually running uh, let me i'm not an expert in in this uh, game but it effectively just does like you know electrical wire movements which is kind of cool Ooh, got a little loop there anyway point being we were able to very easily compile this uh, example so if you want to go take a, a closer look at that definitely do so now the the important thing that we're missing here is like okay so how do we render anything because i don't see any code here that does the rendering of the grid um and there's probably some a lot of other extra stuff that we're not really seeing uh, as far as the runtime is concerned. There is this, uh, well, first of all, there's a wireworld.js file, which is, I believe, hand authored, which does some of this mapping. So if you, if you wanna load up one of these WASM files, what you would do is, uh, I think there's a, another library that gets pulled in first where you have access to the scheme.loadmain, but you're telling it to load that wireworld WASM file. And then all the stuff that, that comes out of it I believe is what was exported by the uh, scheme file to begin with. So everything that came out as this uh, values response or result is what's getting exported effectively. And you're, you're sort of just consuming that as the function. So this is just handles to those scheme functions that get compiled into the WASM file. And then you have this JavaScript code that takes care of the, the normal render loop, uh, knows how to you know, draw all the colors that you see on the screen. Um, knows how to call the update function for updating the state of the world, etc. So there is some work that's, that needs to be done today to wire all this stuff together. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, eventually you will not need to do that because uh, Hoot will have a foreign function interface that will make it possible to define bindings to JavaScript functions so that you can call directly into the JavaScript host and uh, do things against the canvas or anything you need to do without having to have this kind of wrapper. Maybe there's a little bit of wrapper needed. Uh, maybe uh, Dave can say more about that, but at least I think a lot of this wouldn't be necessary. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that there's this JS runtime folder that has some some nice special stuff in it, uh, like a few pre-compiled WASM files and a reflect.js, which I'm not exactly sure what's in there. I haven't looked at it yet. I think it's like uh, standard library stuff, potentially. But anyway, um, that's a look at what a uh, Hoot application looks like today. So um, please feel free to let me know if I missed anything uh, interesting about the code there so that I can point it out to people. Well, I, I think you did a I think you did a pretty good job. Um, uh, to answer your question, the reflect.js file, um, that is the reflection module that allows for inspecting scheme values uh, within WebAssembly in JavaScript ah, so that you get to know, you know, this is a pair, this is a vector, et cetera. And you can, 
So, um, for example, the uh, the wire world grid is simply a byte vector, just as like an easy way to store it. And the reflection module provides a way to access the bytes in that byte vector. And we can iterate across that, iterate over the grid, and then render it with Canvas. So that's um, how that's done. That reflect module, it's a work in progress. There will be more and more functionality for it. But that's essentially gives you the bridge from JavaScript to WebAssembly, and specifically to the Hoot scheme values. Gotcha. Is this something that will be dropped into the output folder by the Hoot tool chain whenever you actually try to compile an application? Well, not currently, um, because, well, when you use the tool chain, you're just going to get the WASM output. Um, if you want to run, again, since Hoot is not specific to uh, a JavaScript host, uh, you just inc you would just include these, this library in the helper uh, WebAssembly modules um, when you want to, you know, you would include that in your web server for when you actually want to run the files. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but the, those uh, reflect.js and the um, helper, the two helper WebAssembly modules pre-compiled, those get included uh, in the installation. So when you run make install or you install like the Geeks package or whatever, that'll be in like the share share Guile Hoot directory, all that, gotcha. all that runtime stuff. So you can just copy it over where you need. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Let's let's go take a look at the actual code for uh, for Hoot then. All right. Let's not do that. Um, so it's a typical Guile project. You see a lot of the same kind of preinst m file. You know, AC local, etc. All this you know general auto make kind of magic. But those aren't the important things. The important things are actually the code. I believe it's under the uh, module folder. So this has the different sort of sections of the code for Hoot. There's the Hoot folder that has the modules for um, the compiler um, and uh, basically the definitions of the primitives at that reflect module that Dave talked about. Uh, also uh, REPL, which actually I was going to ask about as well. I haven't actually tried this out yet, but um, is it possible to have a REPL into a running um, application in the browser currently? Not currently, no. But I imagine that's something but, um, that's intended. Eventually, we would like to be able to host the whole compiler inside of WebAssembly and do and do such things. Um, but that's you know, there's a research project there. Gotcha. Is it um, uh, yeah. kind of a limitation? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And yeah, so with the uh, REPL tools and other things are for use with the development WebAssembly VM, uh, which we use a lot for debugging and so on, but. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's not the primary target for applications. Gotcha. Yeah. It, does WebAssembly have any limitations on like dynamically generating code and, and executing it at runtime? Yeah, there's some challenges there. Sorry, Christine. I think I think Robin probably actually knows the most about the current state of this. Uh, do, you, do you have you are you up to date on that, Robin? Currently, about like doing live code generation. I mean, we've we, our plan for the interpreter has been to do it meta circular, but is there like a way to be able to kind of do live injection of compiled code at this point? Uh, I'm not sure if there's a good way to uh, inject like uh, update WebAssembly modules at web time other than replacing a module that you're using. Um, uh, but we'll definitely be experimenting with that for, you know, being able to do live development in the browser. Uh, currently, we're taking a more uh, compiling the whole program approach in one pass and um, and generating static output for use in the browser. So, yes, it's not like you would be able to target one specific module of scheme code to be recompiled and reloaded. You would have to like, compile the entire thing again. Um, and potentially load that single monolithic WASM file again if you wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah, currently. I mean, so you can't change a WASM module at runtime. Um, it's a fixed thing. But what you can do is if, if you had access to the whole compilers, you can compile a new module and then, li and then link that in. Gotcha. Could you, like, uh, ov mm, sort of overwrite the current module? Like, like let's say you, you generate... Wireworld one, Wireworld two, Wireworld three dot, dot uh, wasm, and like reload the whole thing effectively. Um, I don't know if that's. Pot I guess you could do that if you just have to update all the JavaScript handles into the the WebAssembly modules. But 
well, let's say, you know, if the, if the handle you had in JavaScript was a mutable scheme object, you know, when you, when you update your code, you could modify um, like a struct or something and then access that and you have a new reference. So what we, what we currently already have is that uh, multiple modules can work together um, by sharing the same ABI, the application binary in, uh, interface. So one, one WebAssembly module essentially exports the ABI in additional Hoot compiled modules can import that ABI. So you can actually take values from elsewhere and pass them between the different WebAssembly modules. So there's an element of that currently, um, but what you're missing is uh, the whole compiler tool chain being hosted in the runtime, in the WASM runtime, and, and, and have the necessary host hooks um, to invoke the compiler and then, and then make all that machinery happen. Gotcha. Um, I, I don't actually know what it looks like to do that. Um, presumably, there might be a way to do it, but uh, uh, that'll be that'll be down the road. But more interact interactivity we can get, the better. So we do want that. So uh, if I may uh, throw a question at Robin. Um, Robin, what's the distinction between where we're currently at for version 0 uh, 0.1.0, which is about to come out, versus what we're expecting for 0 0.2.0? Um, like, you know, like what? And uh, and then from there, like what what are the things that we have currently, and where where do we need to go? Because Robin's the one who actually does the most work on this uh, every day, as in terms of like adding these little chunks of features in to be able to make it so that um, Robin and Andy basically. Uh, I would say a couple of the biggest things for the next release are going to be. Uh, record type definitions and the library slash module system, um, which we're going to be using the implementing the R7RS uh, specifications for that. Um, but those are pretty major missing pieces for writing uh, real scheme programs uh, versus having our current set of basic data types in a single top level. So it, it's certainly possible to write real scheme programs uh, like the Wild World game, uh, but uh, that'll make it a lot easier to write uh, idiomatic uh, scheme programs that use the whole R7 RS feature set. So does that mean that uh, now in Guile you could actually use defined library syntax instead of the weird defined module stuff that we have at the moment? Uh, we will probably end up supporting both uh, because we want to support uh, Guile programs uh, and extensions directly uh, to the extent possible. But uh, yeah, we're going to be focusing on R7RS compatibility to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I prefer that just because I, I hate writing uh, hash colon use module 15 times in a <laughs> Guile module definition. <laughs> I think Guile might already support defined library. Does it? Um, okay. Like, I, but I, I don't use it, so don't don't quote me on it. But I, I know we have a number. You know, Guile's a number of R six R S R seven R S small compliant things built in. Gotcha. And our the Hoot thing is a you know it's a separate implementation. But um, I think for regular Guile programs, you can use that if you want. In in other words, right now, if you're using Hoot right now, you're not actually you don't have all of Guile available to you. You saw that there was a quoted form of the, the program, and then there is this kind of like code at the bottom that compiles it, right? Um, the, the place that we're going, you know, through steps is to all of Guile will be available to Hoot users, right? That is where we are moving towards. But initially, we set our target at what's called R7RS small. It is a, um, it's a revision of the scheme standard um, that's like very, it's kind of like a, for language standards, it's pretty small for, you know, doesn't mean it's a small amount of work to get there as Robin can definitely tell you. Um, but, um, but if you consider that the Hoot project has actually only been happening for, um, since I think March, um, um, that like, it's actually an extreme amount of stuff to be able to get done, to be able to get to the point where all this stuff works, right? And uh, um, and Dave's only been on for four months, so to have a compiler within like uh, um, I'm not doing my math in my head, so I think it's probably about you know six or seven months, and then to have the uh, um, the the VM in about four months, that's actually an, an incredible amount of progress. 
Um, but we, we we expect to have everything in there, including fibers, if you're familiar with that, which Guile uses for its asynchronous programming environment, because we expect to have all of Goblins in the browser. Um, and as Dave has indicated, um, we also intend to have um, other be able to make it so that other libraries that you know may normally be thought of as like C library type things, uh, like the game libraries that uh, that that Dave has with uh, Chickadee, also be available to Hoot users. Definitely. But that's a ways out. Well, I mean, I feel like what we have at this moment, at least with you know being able to define a, a uh, uh, the code for a WebAssembly program, e even though it's you know it's obviously limited uh, in that you have this sort of this you know form that has to be compiled. It's enough. I mean, it's it's enough to really start to experiment with this and to write some basic applications, uh, to sort of test the boundaries of what's possible with it at the moment. And you know, zero point one point zero is coming out. You know, in a matter of days, and then you know, zero point two point zero is going to come out, and it's going to have even more support for. Re, quote unquote real programming patterns, I suppose. So I think that uh, you know people are well served to start using it now and give feedback and uh, see what they can do with it. I know I will because I'm really kind of uh, enchanted with the idea of being able to write scheme web apps. But uh, uh, things are only going to get better and, and super rapidly. Like I'm, I think everybody here is super impressed with how fast all this materialized. I know that. Probably Andy's been thinking about a lot of these things for a while, and I know he's also been working toward the possibility of this to exist through the WebAssembly work for a long time. But uh, it's, it's amazing to see it really come to life so fast. I'm, I, I, I'm grateful that the Sprightly Institute exists to sort of be the driver of this effort. Yeah, Andy's expertise and experience working on major web browsers, uh, you know, working on you know, V8 and Spider Monkey for you know Chrome and Firefox respectively has been a huge, huge asset. And of course, he's the Guile maintainer. So, who better to work on compiler backend for Guile than Andy Wingo? Um, so that's it's been really, really great. Definitely. Um, what the one of the other things I wanted to show really quickly in the code is, uh, let's see, the Wasm folder. So this is the library in Guile scheme that can do all the things like assembling WebAssembly, disassembling WebAssembly. Um, a lot of compiler work, compiler optimizations, et cetera. Um, and also the, the VM. So if you want to look at how the WebAssembly is currently being evaluated um, in the development environment, you can take a look at this module. It's, uh, you know, 1,600 lines, 1,700 lines of code, which is pretty good for a full, you know, well, okay, I'm not gonna say full, I don't know if that, that is full, but, uh, you know, a working interpreter for uh, WebAssembly in Guile. So uh, those of you who are sort of curious about how all this stuff works, this is just scheme code. This is not like C code that you have to go and read and interpret uh, in your mind and try to see how it works. It's all scheme code. You can go play around with it in a REPL and, uh, and see how it works. Uh, I would do that, but I think we're a little bit low on time at the moment for sort of, you know, REPL diving. But uh, it's just worth, like, going and take a look at this code because uh, you will feel very uh, at home and warm and fuzzy uh, seeing all the stuff here. I hope that those of you who are scheme hackers in the audience or who watch the recording later um, sort of get excited to come and contribute to this project because I think that there's probably... A lot of places where people can help. In fact, that's one thing. That, one of the things I did want to ask: What is a good area where people could come in and contribute to the project to be able to help this thing accelerate even further? Um, I'll let Dave and Rama comment. I uh, say, as in terms of technical areas where you can do things, I think the most important thing we can use right now is to people to try it. Realize you are being adventurous because uh, we are we're, we're seeing the very first people pick up and actually start to play with this tech right now. We haven't even seen any community oriented projects really released with it. Granted, we just because just a couple days ago is the announcement of the we actually have the scheme version of wire world compiling and running. Right. So if you want to be on the forefront of trying this stuff, realize that you are on the forefront. 
Um, especially, you know, we're going to have this release coming up. We could use your feedback as in terms of what you're, um, what, if you catch anything before the release, we always appreciate that. Um, but if you want to build something, let us know about it. So we, if uh, we're on Libera, uh, the IRC network, uh, you can join hash sprightly. Let us know if you, if you have anything, uh, message us on the Fediverse. Um, uh, I'm sure David could, uh, leave our handles on uh um on the show notes or something yeah um, but like let us know what kind of stuff you're building um but as for technical contributions i'll throw that over to david and robin sure uh well i'm going to throw it to robin um uh, because robin you you've been doing a lot of uh this kind of work day in and day out and i know there's still remaining things so if you're feeling adventurous and actually uh implementing some of r7 rs robin <laughs> Yes, um, if people are interested in contributing uh, directly to the implementation, um, it, yeah, we have uh, multiple areas where people could experiment. Um, and in particular, we have uh, a growing prelude of, uh, of code that is in scheme and uh, using inline WebAssembly to interact directly with our standard library, um, and a, which has a pretty convenient interface. And um, so we'll be uh, continuing to expand that to support more R7RS and Go features. Um, that's definitely one interesting area to look at. And uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, knowing more about how people will end up using the uh, interface, whether it's the command line or the our, oft, our frequent mode of it working directly to REPL, um, knowing what works well and what doesn't for uh, writing our programs would be useful to know outside of uh, what, we, what we write at Sprightly. So. Definitely. Yeah, I imagine there's probably just, you know, all, all kinds of surface area in uh, both R, R7RS or R7RS small and large that could probably use some uh, attention if people were interested. But I guess large maybe is not as high a priority right now as, as small. Um, <laughs> well, since it's not really a thing. Yeah, it's not really final. <laughs> given, yeah. the, given the standardization uh, uh, woes that 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 team is having but yeah so re really it's like r7 or s small because you know that's a good target because of the you know the small part of it and then really it's guile guile special features you know right. um, some of them are already there um delimited continuations that's a huge one like that's so many things are kind of built on that foundation that that's 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 there now um and as robin said there's there's this file prelude.scm that is actually basically the the stuff that is implicitly added to the top of like whatever source you try to compile with it. And it provides the R7 or S implementation essentially. Um, and uh, in that file right now, you'll find a, a certain string literal that uh, shows up quite a bit and it says unimplemented. And um, you know, our, our job is to, you know, and of course we'll, we'll be continuing to do this is just get rid of those unimplemented. Um, uh, but you know, I don't know if there was a low hanging fruit one that you saw and you felt really motivated. Again, this is like very, like, this is really getting in the weeds, but like, you know, take a stab at it you know, if you want. Just, just go into Emacs and, and use uh, consult search and search for unimplemented yeah. in prelude.scm and you'll see a, a nice little list of things that you could go write if you, you wanted know. to. But, you know, more so play with it, you know. Um, there, there, there are gaps, there are things that are maybe not clear in the documentation or things that just straight up broken that we haven't encountered yet. Uh, just, just try it out. That would be amazing. Um, actually, could you show, can you do a, a search real quick for the word inline for inline WASM? Yeah. Cause I want to, I want to show something off that's really special about Hoot. Um, and, and uh, um, Andy provided this. And then I think uh, um, this is what like Robin has to deal with every day, basically. Um, one of the things that's really nice about Hoot is that um, since we are using Guile and since WebAssembly has a Lispy-like syntax, it means that these things compose together really well. Um, and the um, um, we what, what you can see there is this inline WASM expression. Um, this is actually within 
you can write functions and then kind of like how C you can drop to assembly and then like put machine code in there. Basically what's the way that all this stuff is happening is that you have, um, well, not for all of it, but for a lot of it, you have um, scheme code for like a function and then it'll actually say, actually I'm about to drop down and it drops into like, I'm going to splat this assembly right, right into the middle of your code. Um, so it's actually um, possible to compose together since uh, WebAssembly's text format is Lispy, it's possible to compose together scheme programs and then very high performance assembly stuff or just really core primitive assembly stuff in our case, if you're looking at prelude.sem, uh, right together in one thing. And I think that that's something that's very special about the choices that we, we um, choosing Guile specifically um, and WebAssembly together. In yeah. the, the inline WebAssembly feature is going to basically be the way in which you can do a foreign function interface. You'll be able to declare an import, a host import, and what the signature is of that, and then use it. OK, that, that totally makes sense then. Yes, I could see Coming how soon. that plus cond expand is going to make it really easy to, uh, uh, to do you know, multi-targeting of uh, the, the, the standard library and everything, any library, technically. Yeah, you got it. Sweet. Um, let's see. What else? Is there anything else I wanted to ask? So, um, what do you think? Where, where do you think we'll be at? I know this is not really easy to answer this question because a lot of things can happen between now and next year. But this time next year, where do you think we'll be at in terms of uh, Hoot and even ha Goblins? You know, like to to the extent that Goblins is going to be running in browsers and possibly people are building applications with it. Um, let, let's, let's do these as, um, uh, two separate steps. The goal is within the next about five months, hopefully we will have, um, enough, uh, basically all of, uh, um, Guile and Fibers and Goblins working in the browser. Um, so what you're going to start to see over the course of 2024 is um, 2024 is when we expect to have the first semi-user-facing applications start to appear and then also be usable in the browser. And they will use goblins and stuff like that. So you'll start to see some example applications that start to pull all this together. Um, I, but in the next five-ish months is hopefully where we move from um, just um, you know, in about the next month, I expect us to have uh, um, um, 0.2.0 out. I hope, um, and then that'll have um, uh, that'll have the rest of R7 or S small. Um, it could be two months, but we're we're hoping for a month. Um, and uh, um, it, it better be a month. Better be a month, you guys. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, um, and then the uh, um, and then in about. Uh, uh, a few months later is when we hope to have like all of Guile really um, being mostly available. Well, that's super exciting. I mean, at least for me, being a person who wants to use this like uh, as soon as possible, it's great to hear that I'll be able to actually do stuff with it uh, soon. But then, you know, things will just continue to get better as time goes on, especially if people try to contribute, which I, I will try to do at least. Go ahead. And we hope to keep releasing uh, exciting demos. Um, uh, I am very eager to demonstrate uh, document object model interaction, you know, yes. actually adding, doing like some rendering uh, onto the page, like dynamically. Um, for example, uh, I am looking forward to say using uh, SXML to represent uh, HTML elements and then transform that into calls to the host to create elements and put them on the page. I think that would be a very exciting thing to show off. So uh, hoping to get there sooner than later and, and keep showing you know, cool things along the way as we make progress. Client side haunt. <laughs> hmm. Robin, Robin, uh, do, is there anything else in terms of your thoughts on the roadmap that uh, that you think that you think was missing there? Um, I think that covered it pretty well, and we'll also be watching uh, and participating in web assembly development to. Uh, since we're using uh, newly standardized features like uh, WASM GC and uh, 
and others who are going to keep watching WebAssembly development to um, see what new features we can use to make uh, Scheme run better in the browser. So there's some actively developed proposals there, like for direct string support um, versus having to use, say, byte arrays or something like that. So uh, yeah, we're going to keep an eye on that and try and make use of uh, new proposals as they come along. Yeah, what, what is this WTF-8 thing that I'm seeing in the code? It looks like that there's there's like a UTF-8 style thing in there. there, there this, this is a fun story. Um, so a a Andy Wingo, our lead, Giles maintainer, uh, he championed a, uh, a WASM proposal called string ref. And what that would allow for are uh, reference type strings that would be the strings that are on the host system. So when running in the web browser, those would be JavaScript strings. And it's an interface to use them from the web from WebAssembly such that passing them to the host is not a copy, but just passing a reference. So it's, so it's, it's an efficient uh, way to represent strings. This proposal has not made it out of phase one. It does not have the consensus needed for us to use it. It's behind an experimental feature flag um, in V8, and it's not available in Firefox. It, it, we can't rely on it. The WTF8 stuff is a way of dealing with text in like a JavaScript uh, UTF-16 world. And it's the form that we have had to lower our string representation into in order to use it in browsers right now. Um, that uh, has also involved, that, that involves a, a copy on the boundary, which is very uh, unfortunate. Um, but basically, to sum it up, strings are spicy in the WASM community. Um, it's a controversial subject and because there's a lot of parties that are not really interested in that kind of thing. So uh, take that for what it's worth. It's uh, more than I, there's more to it than I know about, but that's what's going on with WTF-8, it's text encoding. Yes, that sounds uh, very much like what I expected to hear. Uh, string, string encoding is always a super big problem. Strings are spicy, Craig says in the chat. You know, I've, this whole time I've been you know, so engrossed in the conversation that I haven't actually paid attention to what people are saying in the chat. So I apologize if I missed any questions, but thank you to Christine for uh, Christine and Dave for answering questions in the chat as all this has been going on. So um, I think that we're out of time. I don't want to take up uh, any more of uh, your time as well because you have a lot of very important things to do. Um, so... What I would like to do is to, once again, encourage people to go try Hoot in its current state. Uh, and definitely after the 0 0.1.0 release comes out in the next couple of days, you know, give them feedback. Uh, I'll try to put a link to um, uh, everyone's handles on uh, the Fediverse inside the show notes so that you can reach out to people directly in case you want to uh, give feedback to someone. Or there's also the, the repositories on GitLab that I showed before. You can go file issues on GitLab. Um, and I certainly would like to check back in with, uh, with you all, uh, as time goes on, you know, like to, to see, you know, what the, the next latest and greatest things are and maybe do a better job of actually demonstrating stuff. Cause I didn't really get much of a chance to do it today. Um, all right. Uh, thank, thank you, all. you for having us on. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so just stick around for just a second, and uh, I'm, I'm going to shut the stream down first, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sign off. But uh, anyway, thank you all uh, so much for being here today. Th those of you who are here to watch the stream, hopefully the split in the stream wasn't too much of a headache. But uh, uh, we'll see you all next time. And until then, happy hacking. We'll see you.